Okay, welcome back to the next video. Um, the last video we just kind of set up the animations. So we just set up the rig to be humanoid and the animations we just kind of set them up to loop if they needed to loop. We set them up the jump, we kind of broke up the jump into the start and the land, so we have that. And what we're going to do today is just actually apply all of this. So we're going to start with the bolt character. And we're going to just consider like building up the animator, then working onto that. So in here, I'm just going to right click and say create animator. I'm just going to name it after the character because you're probably going to have more than one animator in your game. So just name them appropriately. And I'm just going to grab the model that I have and just bring it in. Just going to move it off to the side of here, and this is the character. When you bring a character with animation into Unity, it'll automatically add an animator component in the inspector. And you'll see that it's currently got the avatar we created assigned to it. I'm going to turn off apply root motion because I'm not going to be using root motion here. Root motion is when you actually use the animator, the animation, sorry, to physically move the character around the scene based on the actual animation from Blender, Max, Maya, whatever it is that you use. But now you'll see that where it says controller, it says none runtime animator controller. So I'm going to go back to my animation and just drag the, the animator controller that I created onto the character. And then I'm just going to double click on the animator to open it up. It normally opens up in the middle screen where your scene and your game view is. And we'll have three nodes here. We'll have a entry. This is where the first, when you hit play on the game, the, the, the animation that's attached to the entry will play first. Any state is a way to override whatever is happening in the entry state with whatever's in the any state. So if you're running along and then you hit an attack animation, you could set up a really elaborate blend tree, or you could just set up your attacks to be attached to the any state. So no matter what's happening in the entry, if I hit the attack button, that animation will override this animation. So just to keep that in mind, let's talk about navigation in the animator. The animator's and navigation is pretty much like the viewport, so middle mouse button to pan, your wheel mouse button to zoom in and out. And on the left side here, we have two tabs. We've got the layers tab and the parameters tab. So we won't be covering layers, so click on the parameters tab, make sure you're on that tab. And we'll talk about the other things as we go. So I want to start by creating a blend tree. So I'm going to right click, create an empty state, this is going to be our starting state. I'm going to rename that state, state to movement or locomotion, whatever you want to call it. And it's currently got no animation assigned on the right here. You can see that. It's got no motion. The speed is when is the actual physical playing speed of the animation. It's like when you play a video at twice the speed or three times the speed. So if you want to just, if your animation is a little bit slow and you want to kind of speed it up and you don't want to go back to your 3D application, tweak the, the, the keyframes, then come back here. All you do is just, the bigger the value, the faster it'll go, the smaller the value, the slower it will go. And we won't talk about the rest of this stuff until we get to it. So we don't worry about that. So let's start by creating a blend tree. So I'm going to right click, create new blend tree and state. The moment you do that, it will, you won't see anything, essentially. It will look like nothing has happened. That's because, think of... This is what we call a finite state machine, so it works in different states. You can only be in one single state at any given point. And in a state, which is this movement, there can be like layers of fuel. There's something inside of this movement. So if I double click on my movement, I'm now inside of that tr node. And if you look at the top, you can see that at the top, we were originally just said base layer at the top here. And if I double click on it, I'm no longer in base layer, I'm inside of base layer and I'm inside of the movement node. So I'm in the base layer and inside of the movement node. And in here we have our blend tree. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly do a little show and tell here with Photoshop. So apologies for my crude um, writing and drawing with my mouse. Just to kind of explain how blend trees work, or at least how the one we're gonna use is. So I'm just gonna create a new file quickly. Okay, so we're going to use what they call a one-dimensional blend tree. So a normal blend tree can be set up using two values, your x value 
and your Y value. So like a graph. And whatever happens, you can have one animation here and you can have another animation there. And based on your input value, so if you used, let's say, the W key for this and the D key for this, oh wow, that's well done, then whatever animation is here, when you press both of these keys, you're going to essentially blend between these two animations at the midpoint. So that's what that essentially does for the blend tree. So what we're going to do is use a 2D blend tree, a one-dimensional one blend tree, which is essentially using only a single value. So from left to right or right to left. So we're going to have this side and that side. And in this case, we're going to use the input value from the player. So it's going to start at zero, end at one. And the zero is going to be the idle animation. And on the one, it's going to be my run animation. And when I press the input button on my keyboard, which is your uh, like A or D key to move left or right, it's going to animate, it's going to speed up the value from left to right, and I'm going to play the run animation. When I release the button, it's going to go in the opposite direction, and it's going to go to the idle animation. So that's what is that's essentially what is what we're going to be creating. So if we go back to Unity, and we do that here, we have a blend tree. And if you select it, by default, it is a one-dimensional blend tree. And you can see that there is a parameter. Parameters are va uh, uh, variables, essentially. So they're just calling it parameters here, but it is a variable. You can see by default, it created one called blend here on the left. Double-click on that. Let's just call that, let's actually just call that player speed, just so that it makes sense. Player speed. So this is a, as you can see, 0.0. .0. It is a float value. And now we're using player speed in here. So we only need two animations. So we're going to hit the, where it says motion, list is empty. Click the little plus to add a motion field. And click the plus one more time to add a second motion field. And the first one, where it, are we going to add the idle animation? And the second one, we're going to add the running animation. Now if I extend this down here a little bit so you can see it, and I hit play, It'll be playing the idle animation. The moment I select this little green square, uh, like triangle thing, and drag it across, you'll see it starts to blend from idle. And at the middle point, it tries to blend the two animations together. So it does the idle animation with the running uh, animation, kind of creates this limping kind of animation. And then all the way to the right, it just does the running animation. There we go. So that is how we set up our blend tree, and this is a very basic one. You could add a third state and add a walking animation if you wanted to, so that if you're playing on the, the gamepad or uh, using the analog sticks, you could say that as you hold the analog stick halfway, you would walk, and then when you uh, go full extent with your analog stick, you'll go into the running animation. Okay, so that is the movement. Let's get that set up inside of Bolt. And then we'll get that set up inside of uh, the code itself. So I'm going to select my character, go to my flow graph, maximize it so you guys can see it better. And essentially I'm going to do this in the update. So it, uh, every frame it's going to update. So I'm going to right click and type in update to add an update function. Let's let it decide to find it for me. There we go. And we're going to require one thing. So in the object variables, I'm going to add a animator reference. So I'm calling it animator reference, and the, the, the variable type needs to be of animator. Okay, so I'm just going to click on the little circle to the right. I'm going to look for the character in the scene because he's already there. So I'm just going to apply that character. So that, remember, the animate, we're using a empty game object essentially to drive the character around. What's powerful about doing it this way is I can change the model that is going to be parented to this controller and not, and all I need to do is make a reference to the animator and I'm good to go. Whereas if you were to apply the script and the collide and all that to the actual physical model, every time you've got a new model, you would have to redo all of that work. Whereas this one, you simply just parent the, the model to the object, make sure the scale is right, adjust the collide if need be, and assign the animator, like we've just done here. So I'm going to grab the animator into the scene. I'm going to drag off the animator and type in animator.setFloat, because remember we're using a float value. We're going to use the one that's name, comma, value, because we want to just feed in the value into the animator, and the name we called it was player speed, if I remember correctly. That is the name of the variable 
you're wondering where I'm getting that, it's this value right here. This is the variable, it's player speed. So I try to make sure these are case sensitive. So if you can't remember how you spelt it, just double click on the variable, go control C, go down here, control V to paste it. Just so that you have the exact same naming on both variables. Now, what are we gonna use for the, the physical input? We're gonna do something so I can show you it's going to break, but I wanna show you so you can see how we're gonna fix that. So you go to the graph and grab your player input variable and plug that in directly into your value. I'm going to just make a little comment group around this and call this feed input to player animator. That's it, feed input into player animator. That is all we're essentially doing right here. So we haven't really set up the scene yet, so I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna grab my little character and I'm gonna parent this character and just rename him to both so we know which characters, which uh, code. So I'm going to grab this character and parent it to the bolt character. Now you'll see that the bolt character is here, but the model is offset. So select the model and make sure that the X, the Y, and the Z are zeroed out so that he is literally inside of this capsule. Now you have one of two things you can do. You can change the capsule collider to suit the model, or we, in this case, I'm just going to scale the model to make sure it's about the same size as my capsule. And then I'm just going to delete these stand-in geometry that we had initially for our character. Gonna just double check the capsule if it covers the character properly, which it seems to do. Okay, and all that's left to do now is to try it out and see what happens. So he should go into his idle position when we're standing still. There we go. And when I run left, notice how nothing happens. When I run right, it plays the running animation. Left doesn't work. Right does. Now, if you look at the flow graph down here, let me make this a little bit bigger. Notice how the input value is currently zero, where my cursor is. If I go right, I get a positive value. If I go left, I get a negative value. So that's where the problem comes in. So I set up my animator, if we go back to our blend tree, between, if you look at the way that it says threshold, between zero and one. Now, there are several ways we can fix this. We could go and add another animation and change the thresholds to be minus one, zero, and one. Or we can just simply, and this is the easier part than maintaining one extra animation, is in the flow graph, just drag off the player input and type in absolute. And what absolute does is it whatever value comes from the player input, it's always going to be positive, regardless of whether it's, even if it's negative. So even if I go minus one, it's going to turn that into a positive number. And then I'm going to have a positive value, which means when I test my running animation now, he's going to run left, he's going to run right, and when I stop, he goes into his idle. There we go. Playing the animation. Okay, so when he jumps, he still runs in the air. We need to rectify that. But everything else is working as expected. So uh, we are going to go to the, we're going to duplicate this character. I'm going to rename the end to code, or you can call it C sharp. Let's do that. And I'm going to parent that to the C sharp player controller. And again, it's going to be offset. So make sure that we offset 0, 0, 0 in all of the positions. And I'm just going to delete the existing meshes so we have now got two characters and again if we test it now you'll see that the one character is working because we've set it up but now we need to go to the code version and set that up as well both of them will still behave the way they're supposed to so they the controller works just fine but the animations aren't essentially playing on the code version so we're going to do stage by stage so now we're going to go to our c sharp script just move this down. I like to have my code at the bottom of all of my stuff. I'm going to open up the script inside of Visual Studio Code. And remember, we need to create a variable like we did in Vault. So underneath, okay, so this is a good example of what happens. If you're going to get, if you get these kind of errors using Visual Studio Code like I have in the past, at first I just essentially just went back to Visual Studio Community. If you get these kind of errors, all you need to do is close your script and go to your Unity, go to Assets, go to Open C Sharp Project. 
because what happens is it's almost like it's not uh, Unity Official Studio Code isn't aware that this is being uh, this is a Unity script. So if you open it, if you just say open C sharp project once on that project that's giving the issue, you can just open your scripts like normal after that, and everything should be fine. Okay, so let's add a new variable here. Make this a serialized field. Remember, we created a reference to the animator. And this one's going to be animator reference. So we're making a reference to the animator. So that in the update, remember we did in the update, so I'm just going to add a new line in the update now, just give it space so we can read it. I'm going to comment this out as in update animator with player inputs. Essentially that is exactly what's happening. So over here, we're going to go and say animator reference dot set float like we did in the bolt. Two round brackets because when you hover over the set float, it tells you it needs a string, so it needs the name of the variable and it needs the value. So whenever you see string, you know you need to put in quotation marks. And in here, we're just going to type in player speed. And outside of the quotations marks, but still inside of the brackets, we're going to go comma, and we're just going to put in the player input like we did earlier on. And we're going to have the exact same problem we had before. So I'm just going to save this and show you, and then show you how we fix that. Is before you do anything, or it's not going to work, is you'll have a new variable available, the animator, so you need to drag your model and put it in here, or simply click on the circle to the right and look for the one that says C-sharp and assign the animator to that. And let's test this again. As you probably have guessed from what when we did it with Bolt, to the right, both characters will run. To the left, only the one character will run. So how do we fix that? We do the exact same thing we did inside of a bolt but th this one's a little more uh it's trickier so we're going to cut that out we're going to type in map f dot abs and in the brackets we're going to put in our player input so math dot f so any kind of math function like uh, that you want to do like math dot range and math f dot range you can get certain things they just they have created a nice set of little functions that allow you to that speed up your workflow like get distance that kind of stuff there's a really nice set of tools that you, uh, unity has uh, with c sharp that's allowed for that and it by, by that extension it goes into bolt as well so we're going to go math f dot absolute abs is short for absolute and then player input so if we try that now Allow the script to recompile. We're going to try it one more time, and both characters should be doing what they are required to be doing. So, run left, run right, and then now we, all we need to do now is just set up the animator to jump. So now they run when I stop. They idle. Notice how the move do a little bit of uh, the feet do a little bit of moving. That's because I disabled all the root motion on that. I um, probably should enable the root motion back on that so the feet don't do a little bit of sliding. And when I mean root motion, I mean on the import of the animation physically, not on the actual animator itself. Okay, so there we go. Both characters are now moving. They're behaving the way they're supposed to. They're both sharing the same animator, which is really nice because all I need to do is go to my animator, go to my base layer. I'm going to make this a bigger window. Sorry, I lie. I can't. And drop this down. I'm going to go to my project, go to my animations folder, and I'm going to look for my jump. And if you click on the little arrow to the right, you will see two other triangles. You'll see two triangles in here. If you select both of them and drag them in, you are dragging the animations that we split up, the jump start and the jump land. So if your window looks more like this, all you do is click the arrow on the right side, and you'll still see that there's a little triangle icon next to the animations, but you'll be able to read the animations properly. If you're kind of starting out with Unity and Unity's icons will be relatively large, then you're gonna to have to just click the arrow to the right and then if you're lucky enough and you can actually see the name of the animation, if not, you just kind of drag them and see which one it is. Or just move this little slider at the bottom of the window to the left to give you more of a list view. <coughs> And now I can go into this window. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the jump start up here. Jump start over there. Uh, jump land over there. And we're going to create something called a transition. So a transition is how we're going to move from this node to that node to that node and back here. So select the movement node. Right click and say make transition. And drag to the one that you want the animation to move to. Click on that one. 
do the same thing. We're going to do that two more times, like that. And notice how the arrows flow in a single directional. They're not bi bi-directional, they're only a single direction. So if uh, I've seen it happen in the past where you don't kind of make any, you don't think anything of it, so you just kind of like, ah, sorry I did that. You kind of do this and then you're testing it, but your jump doesn't work. Remember, it can't run that way because the arrow is saying that it needs to go down towards the movement. So let's just make sure that our uh, transition lines are flowing in the right direction. And all we need to do is now, each of these lines require a reason for going from this node to that node. Needs to know why we're going to go from movement to jumping. And so we need to give it a reason. So on the left, where we have our parameters, next to the little plus sign at the top, click on the little drop down, and you'll see that um, Unity's animator supports uh, essentially your four main uh, variables your float, your int, your bool, and your trigger. Now, a trigger is essentially a bool. So what happens is you tell it, do the following, and the moment it does, you turn it to be true, and then the moment it's done, it turns itself back to false. So triggers are really helpful if you just want to fire off an event, but you don't need to check to see if that you need to go in and out of that state relatively easy. So I'm going to use a boolean, and we're going to call this one grounded. I'm going to turn that on by default just to be safe because I assume my character will be on the ground by default. So I'm just going to turn that on to true. I created a bool and I'm going to select the first transition line and notice how the inspector window populates. I'm going to make this smaller so we don't see that. Populates with new information. Right at the top it says has exit time. What that means is regardless of the conditions you have down here, so if I were to go and add a condition down here, this condition needs to be true and the animation needs to fully complete before you go to the next transition. So if you're making a game and then you realize you hit space bar and the character jumps, but the animation jumps a little bit later, the physical animation playing, you probably have has exit time on. So we're going to turn has exit time because the moment I hit space bar, I want both the jump and the animation to happen simultaneously. So I'm turning off has exit time. And at the bottom here, you'll see there are conditions, and it says currently the list is empty, so click the little plus to add it. And we don't want to use the player speed, we actually want to use grounded. And in this case, grounded has to be false, which means we're no longer on the ground in order for the jumping to start. So we're going to set that to false. So that's it for this transition. So we're going to now see from the jump start into your jump land, we need to click on it and again turn has exit time off. We're going to add a condition, we're going to change it to grounded, and this time it needs to be true, which means we've touched the ground. And then the last one's the easiest one, we're going to leave it as it is, because we'll leave this state once the animation has completed. So that's why I'm leaving has exit time on, and I'm not putting any conditions. So when the animation is completed, it's going to go back to the movement state, and that's pretty much it for the the setup here. So we now just need to go to Bolt. And I'm just going to move this down here. Let's try that again. I'm just going to change the box color, the, the group color here. Maybe an orange. And we're going to do this in our ground check. So we're going to go down to our ground check. We're going to grab our animator reference. And we're going to drag from the animator reference. We're going to type in Animator dot set bool this time instead of set float. Same thing, name, comma, value. I'm going to plug the first one into my on trigger enter. And what was the name? We called it grounded. And instead of just having these two tick boxes and keep having to tick them on and off in case I go and change things, all I'm going to do is plug the grounded variable into my value. Because remember, this is a boolean. And if this comes back as true, then that'll be true. And all I need to do is to tick one area. All I need to do is tick this on or off, and both of these become true or false. Instead of having two of these, and having to make sure I go and tick both of them on all the time. Because it's, uh, it's, it leads to way too much room for error, to be completely honest. Okay, so we're going to drag it out one more time. Type in animator.setBool. I'm going to plug this one into the exit, which means we're leaving the ground. I'm going to type in the name grounded again, or you can just duplicate the node above. And I'm going to plug this variable into there. And I'm going to add a comment group around this, call this 
set animator grounded based on result. That's it. So set the animator based on the result of whether or not we're grounded or whether we're in the air. And that's pretty much it for the jumping. Probably going to have to do a little bit of tweaking here and there, but outside of that, this will work just fine for what we need it to do. So let's test that out. Thank you so much for watching these videos, guys. It does help a lot. So now notice he goes into the jump, the one on the left, and plays the landing. Jump, landing, jump, landing. I feel the animations are... Uh, the, the jumping one just takes uh, happens too slowly. So let's go and tweak the speed of that. So I'm going to go into my animator, go into my jump start, and I'm just going to make that play twice as fast. So the speed value I'm going to set to 2 instead of 1. And again, I'm just using Mixum animations. If I wanted to animate this myself, it might be a little bit faster. Um, I would probably go and animate this correctly and separate the animations that are in the way that is required. So that you can see it now, it's working. So we need to just do a few tweaks here and there. And But we're not at the tweaking phase, we're just at the setup phase. Now notice how his feet fall through the floor there a little bit, if I'm correct. Let's just double check the animation to make sure that's not a case in the actual animation. I'm going to select this. I'm going to select the jump land. I'm going to expand this at the bottom again. And just play the animation. No, I think it's just... No, his, his feet are through the floor if you look over there. So I'm going to use the root transform position Y and just add a little bit of negative offset just to pull him above the ground until I kind of eyeball it. So I think it looks like it's minus 0 0.25. And then I'm going to just apply that and see if that's fixed the, f the problem. This is the problem with using other animations than our custom animations. Okay, so the landing animation also just happens too slowly. So I'm going to grab the landing animation also make it about 1.5. And then I think we're ready to go and write the, the code version of this. Yeah, that's not bad. Okay, so I'll probably speed that up one more time just to exaggerate the motion, just to show you can adjust speeds of animations. Okay, so let's go to the C sharp and do the exact same thing. So we're going to open up the script back in Visual Studio Code. I'm going to go down to where we have the on trigger enter and the on trigger exit. And over here, we're going to just add a new line underneath it. Say animation reference dot set bool. Add two round brackets. Remember. String needs to be in quotation marks. And what is the value? We're just using the one right in the line right above it, right there. So using grounded, as and because it's set to true, then this will be set to true. And all we're going to do is just duplicate this line, move this line underneath the second one, and we are pretty much done with the code version. Again, if you start to follow with this, you'll see it's identical in the way the coding logic happens. They're both doing the exact same thing. That's why both characters behave in exactly the same manner. There's no difference. Now they're both playing the jumping and landing. There we go. That's it for this video. I hope this has helped. Uh, next video, we're just going to kind of make the camera follow the player. Just kind of. So that it just starts to feel more like a side scroller as opposed to kind of a locked off screen, kind of something like, uh, I don't know, let's say The Binding of Isaac or where those room based tiles or dungeon crawlers where the camera kind of locks to the room and then when you go to the new room, it locks to the next room, that sort of thing. So we're just setting up a camera that's going to follow the player. So until the next video, thank you for watching and be safe.